awesome to be with you, you here this morning. I feel like I've preached in forever, and uh, you know how excited I get to, to start new series. So uh, I'm very excited to get into Philippians with you all today. Uh, I think I've shared with you before, uh, if I wasn't a pastor, I, I know what I would be. Uh, I would be a poet. That's what I absolutely want to do. Uh, but it's, that's a hard gig these days. Not a lot of people getting paid to sit under trees wearing frilly hats, uh, writing stuff with quills. Uh, but that's what I would do. And so I, uh, you know, I, I, I would start more sermons, I think, with poems. I just got to get permission of the pastor to do that. Uh, but I wanted to start with one today. Uh, as we're looking at Philippians, this is just one that reminds me of that book a little bit. Uh, I started a series of poems years ago when I was at seminary on just interactions with people that I didn't know, didn't know their names, didn't know anything about them, just little reflections on them. And I wrote this one uh, on the first snow of, uh, that happened in the fall, just looking out my window, I noticed someone else that noticed it too. I wanted to share this as we get started today. I saw Joy just once, but she did not look back. With sin in preponderance among our many deeds, I could not help but take notice of one face gone bright. Alive to the newness of snow on a fall day, she had forgotten her own fears momentarily and remembered bliss and gladness unending. Her name is unknown to me, and yet it must be joy. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we slow down and uh, crack open a new book, we ask that you would just uh, help this scripture, this uh, good word to come alive in us, Lord. Um, We are a people that I, I think we can identify quite well with the church in Philippi that Paul is writing to. Uh, I think we have our own trials and and tribulations. I think we have our own weights and things that uh, just uh, burden us and are on our mind. Um, We need guidance. We need your help uh, for how to navigate this world, for how to uh, live as Christians within it. So Lord, would you just speak to us today and, and throughout this series Help us, Lord, for help just with this book be new and fresh and encouraging for us uh, as we navigate this season of life. We love you, Lord. We want to love you even more. In your name we pray. Amen. So this morning we, we do begin our new series on Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. This letter is only four chapters long, but within those four chapters are some of the most potent and beloved and cherished passages that Paul would ever write. And so we're going to take our time working our way through the, this letter, a half chapter at a time. We're going to kind of stop to smell the roses a little bit, uh, in part because this letter is so needed today. As I've read through this letter a few times in the last few weeks, uh, that's one of the things that's been consistently on my mind. You need to hear this letter. Uh, what it emphasizes, you and I should dwell on these things. One of the fascinating things about this letter is the circumstances under which it was written. Philippians is one of Paul's last letters, and it's his last letter that's written to a church. Uh, after Philippians, Paul would later write Titus and First and Second Timothy, what are called his pastoral epistles, written to individuals who were serving as pastors. Uh, Paul wrote Philippians from jail, along with Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. These are called his prison epistles or his prison letters. So what makes this particular letter unique? Well, as the last of these letters, Paul was more aware than ever before that his time in jail would most likely end in his execution. I don't know if you've ever received a phone call from jail. I'm sure probably some of you have. Uh, I have. Uh, I hope you haven't. Um, They're shortened to the point. There's a real sense of desperation and direction. I need you to call these people for me because I can't. I need you to help me get out of here. And this is where Paul's letter is surprising because it isn't desperate. It isn't hopeless. In fact, it's lovely and it's trusting. It's full of love and appreciation at the worst of times. It's distinctly Christian. It looks and feels like how a Christian ought to be talking about their life and their hardships and their suffering. I'm sure that you've heard of the Roman Emperor Nero, 
Uh, Nero would become well known for his persecution of Christians. Because of Nero, Christians would be burned on the stake alongside Roman roads, like candles. Nero was the emperor to see Paul thrown in jail. And like Paul, Nero was an author, a prolific writer, in fact, as well as being, you know, the most powerful individual on the planet at the time. So poetry, you know, writing, kind of, I don't know, important. Um, But none of what Nero wrote, this incredibly powerful man, none of what he wrote remains. We don't even have a fragment of it. But the relatively poor tent maker that he had arrested, his letters we have. Paul's name is known the world over. Indeed, the time has come, as T.R. Glover has observed, when people name their dogs Nero and their sons Paul. Isn't our God telling a fascinating story? Paul himself would be a little uncomfortable with all this. He never had any intention of people describing themselves as followers of Paul. Paul, as we'll see, thought of himself as a servant. Like Luther was horrified to find that people were calling themselves Lutherans by the time Luther uh, died, Paul would be equally uncomfortable. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, When one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not merely human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollo swatered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So now that you know a little bit about Paul and where Paul's coming from in writing this letter, let's learn a little bit more about this place and the people that Paul's writing to. The city of Philippi, and I've got a few photos, that's where it's located at there, a little west of Turkey, um, uh, along, the, along the sea there. Um, and I've got a few more like, cool f- pictures of showing you some of the, uh, what still remains there of Philippi. Uh, it had been a Roman colony since Mark Anthony and Octavian defeated the forces of Brutus and Cassius. You might know them from Julius Caesar. They were the ones who assassinated Julius Caesar. Um, in 42 BC, Paul's writing this letter just about exactly 100 years later. Uh, 100 years after that, in 62 AD. The city had a proud Roman character. It was trying to be as Roman as it possibly could. It wanted good standing within the empire. Its architecture and administration were modeled on Rome itself. You'll see a lot of similar things if you look at what remains. Paul chose Philippi as his first outreach into Macedonia because it was such an important city. But really, to say that Paul chose to go there at all is something of a misnomer. The choice to go there at all was not really up to him from the beginning. Paul had wanted to go somewhere else. Paul had set his sights on Bithynia in Asia Minor. But the Spirit of God led him to go to Philippi. This is such a unique moment in the New Testament. As far as I know, the only one of its kind. Where the Spirit of God actually stops Paul from going and doing something and redirects him somewhere else. Paul had a dream. Acts 18, of a Macedonian saying to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul and his companions set sail for Philippi. They only stayed there a few days. That's all the context we really have for this letter. He spent a few days on mission in Philippi. Um, But they were eventful. Paul had a habit, uh, what he'd do when he went to another town on one of his missionary journeys, he'd seek out the synagogue of the town. And he'd go there and he'd speak from there. But in Philippi, there was no synagogue. He only found a place outside of the city gate by a river where some women who worshipped the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob gathered each Sabbath to pray, Acts 16, 13. They gathered there because Jewish worship was not welcomed in a city that was trying to be as Roman as it possibly could. But in the short time that Paul and and his companions were there, um, a woman named Lydia came to faith, and she and her family were baptized, and a church was born. Paul and Silas were then immediately, it seems, thrown into prison. Nothing was easy about ministry in Philippi. But a few came to faith in spite of their circumstances. That included a jailer when the jail was ripped apart when Paul and Silas are in prison there by an earthquake. And the jailer simply asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? By the end of the chapter... They say goodbye to Lydia and the believers 
of this newfound church, which consisted of women, a jailer and his family, a slave girl, and a few others. And they left. Paul writes this letter to that little church about 10 years after first visiting them. Aware that their challenges have only increased, opposition is still strong. He encourages them in a hard place to stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Paul knew that they needed encouragement, encouragement to keep going, encouragement to believe in an unbelieving world. And so do you. People of every generation have needed reminders, encouragement, hope to keep going because things are not as they should be. And we see that consistently throughout both scripture and human history. We see it as early as Genesis 3, but it's echoed everywhere in places like Isaiah 5 and Romans 1, the idea that not only do people in our world practice evil, they call it good and they approve of others who do it as well. And that's true. That was true in Philippi and it's true today. And that would be bad enough. It's certainly enough to make us angry and fearful or both. But what's really bad, what grieves the Spirit of God, what breaks the heart of God, is that all, what also echoes throughout Scripture is that we, the very people of God, people who should know better and therefore do better, we judge and hate too. We'll wallow in greed and jealousy too. We excuse our sin too. This happens as early as Genesis 3 as well. This is echoed in Isaiah and the prophets and Amos and Paul himself in Romans 2 and 7. We need hope. That God is not done with us. That God can use even us. That God will sanctify us, smooth our sharp edges, make us soft and warm and compassionate, that we will look more like Jesus and less like everything else that makes us angry and fearful and steals our joy. See, you and I need this letter. Because I, for one, want to believe that God isn't done with me yet. I want to believe that he has more desires for this community and my neighborhood and that I can work to that end. That he can use even me. That's what the church in Philippi needed to hear and that's what we still need to hear today. There are four key themes in this book uh, and I'm going to give them with, to you now. I'm going to share them up front. Um, and part of why I want to do that is I want you to help me look for them in the text. Um, watch as they come up uh, again and again. All four of these themes are relevant and are vital for us as we attempt to embody our faith today. Here are Paul's four themes in this letter. Number one, Philippians is about Christian unity. Coming together for the sake of our witness, for the sake of just one more person coming to saving faith. Number two, Philippians has much to say about the problem of suffering. How does a Christian remain faithful through pain? When things don't make sense, when God allows something we never thought he would, how do we believe then? Number three, Philippians explores the relationship between God's grace and our work. Change in our world will come through and from God. Where do I come in? And number four, Philippians says much about the church's relationship with the world around it. How do we bring holiness into our streets and our neighborhoods? These are the primary themes found in the book of Philippians. Yet, yet Paul highlights one element above all others. There are a number of things that describe, uh, are described in Scripture as being inherently Christian, right? Attitudes and actions that are distinctly Christian, unique in our world. No other worldview believes them, let alone uh, attempts them. Christians, more than any other group, ought to love one another. Christ told us that this is how we ought to be known in our world. Christians ought to love their enemies and pray for them. That's unique, isn't it? Christians should take the high road, doing what is right regardless of anticipated outcomes. Because we're serving unto the Lord in whatever we're doing. We're called to obedience, not success. In the book of Philippians, Paul highlights one distinctly Christian characteristic that ought to be in each one of us. And it's a factor in each of the four key themes of this book. It ought to contribute to Christian unity. It shows up even in the midst of suffering. It is, a high, it is highlighted all the more by God's grace in our lives and how we respond to him. And it is one of the purest forms of evangelizing the world around us. 
What is this singular characteristic? My friends, it's joy. For this reason, Philippians, for many, has a favorite of the New Testament. Who doesn't want more joy in their life? That's an easy sell, isn't it? That should be on every banner we have, right? Who doesn't want more joy? Everybody does. But as we'll see for Paul, this joy is so much more than a feeling. It's witness. It's exuberance in the face of suffering. It's devotion in the worst of times. Joy, and this is important, it's going to be a theme, joy is the symptom of a known hope. Joy is the symptom of a known hope. Joy is not some sort of thing you have to bubble up on your own. Joy is not some sort of thing that just will only come by deep meditation and tons of quiet time. Joy is a symptom of something already happening. If the hope is there, joy will be there. It's a symptom. You can't even control it. Let's see how Paul begins this letter to this 10-year-old church in Philippi. Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves of Jesus Christ, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not the only place that Paul refers to himself as a slave. In both his letters to the Romans and to Titus, Paul identifies himself as a doulos, the Greek word for servant or slave. But in, in every other instance, in each other instance where, where this happens, Paul then immediately make sure to insert his title. He refers to himself as an apostle, a title with some heft to it, to show that he has authority to speak on uh, weighty issues. As Protestants, we believe that the number of apostles is very small. Jesus named 12, and then Matthias replaced Judas. Paul is called an apostle, and only a select few others. Apostolos, or sent ones, were the foundations of the early church, handpicked by God to write scripture and to share the revelation of God. All who follow Christ are disciples. But the title of apostle carries the weight of authority. And Paul doesn't feel the need to share that here. He doesn't use the word. Paul and Timothy. Timothy is also named an apostle in 1 Thessalonians 2.6. Write to you as servants of Christ, slaves of the Son of God. This is humility on Paul's part. This is Paul looking you eye level rather than shouting commands from some point of authority. This is Paul speaking kindly, sweetly even to a church that he loves, to a church that needs hope. I thank my God every time I remember you. It's like a love letter. It really is. In all my prayers for you, all, for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Paul's joyful as he prays for them and thinks of them. From jail, he's joyful. To a little church that is suffering real, tangible hostility. Why? Why joy? Well, because for Paul, joy meant something altogether different. For Paul, joy is not the result of finding himself in comfortable circumstances, but of seeing the gospel make progress through his circumstances and through the circumstances of the Philippians, whatever they might be. Joy comes from looking at our footprints and realizing that we aren't where we used to be anymore. God has been at work in us. Not 20 years ago when I bent my knee in salvation, not just then. He's been walking with me the whole time. He's changed me. I'm not where I was. It brings joy. God is doing something here. It's detached from circumstance. The way Paul puts it here is held up as a promise because it tells us something about God, verse 6, that he's confident, Paul's confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul's confidence is not in human beings. 
That's not where his hope is. He's not writing them with joy because they just, they just do everything right. He trusts in the God that they serve. Don't put your hope in human beings. His hope is in the God who sanctifies them. Joy is the symptom of a known hope. I understand what Paul is saying. I've enjoyed that same hope. When my friends and family, when those in the church that I serve are more Christ-like today than they were yesterday or the year before, joy wells up in me. A symptom of a known hope. When we take Jesus' words and apply them to ourselves instead of yielding them like a sword to strike at others, there's joy here. When we deny ourselves and sacrifice and surrender, there's joy when you show with your words and your actions that Jesus has your trust and not anything else. There's joy there. It's a symptom of a known hope. That God is at work in the human heart. I'm confident in him. I'm confident in his ability to convict the world and me of our sin. And that by his spirit, he will not give up on us. He will save all that he can. And then Paul closes his introduction with these words. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more. More and more and more and more and more and more. In knowledge and depth of insight. So that you will be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul tells us the content of his prayers for this little church. These are the things, when I think of you, this is what I think of and this is what I pray for. That they would be more loving. That they would be righteous so that their world would not so that their witness would not be spoiled. And when when people see their love, it wouldn't be just seen as hypocritical. That they'd be both loving and righteous. They need to be righteous so that they can be above reproach, so that no one can accuse them of unforgiveness or hate or jealousy or unrepentant sin. That way their love will be a good witness. And sandwiched between these two prayers, love and righteousness, Paul prays that they would have wisdom, discernment, Consistently in the New Testament, when believers are encouraged to pray with the promise that God will provide for what they need, we're drawn to those verses. We see them. Those are the ones that are on our kitchen refrigerators. Those are the ones my mom has at home that I grew up with seeing every day. Those verses, would God give us what we want when we ask for it? Always about asking for wisdom. When we ask God for wisdom, Scripture affirms, God will give it to us. I'm I'm more confident of that promise of God than just about anything else. I've seen it. I've lived it a billion times. Every day I've seen that. God will give it to us. Mark 11, Matthew 7, John 14, John 16, James 4, 1 John 1. Again and again and again. When we ask God for wisdom, he gives it. James writes plainly in the introduction to his letter, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. I love that. I love James. He's so plain with us. Because God gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. That's a promise. That's a promise. Need wisdom with how to navigate a situation? Ask God. He will tell you. He will give you direction for what to do. Paul knew that this fledgling church needed wisdom. Wisdom to do more than give intellectual assent to biblical doctrines. That's good and right and important. They need to know how to be Christians in a place that does not care for them. They need to know how to actually be effective, how their love can be made real in a context that they lived in. Wisdom to do more than than just give right answers. They needed wisdom for how to be a church in a place where a Savior wasn't welcome, where they thought they already had one. How do you follow God then? How do you follow God from jail, as Paul was doing? How do you show obedience in the midst of limitations, when no one else seems to be? When you question your influence because you're an outsider? They would need an increasing awareness of the will of God, but paired with that, it is a good thing to know the will of God. It's a good thing to know what God desires. But paired with that, they and we need a desire to actually do it. 
to actually get our butts off the pews and move out of these, move out of these doors and love people well. And you know what, church? They did. They did. They did. Why does Paul love them? Because he's, he's seeing a symptom of known hope. He's seeing God at work in a group of people that started out praising God out of, out of a river. They did. They did it. It's possible. You and I, I think sometimes, so much of what churches needs to be doing is reminding us it's possible. Yes, we're just individuals. Yes, it's just one family by one family. Yes, it's possible, even for us, to love in a Christ-like way, to make a difference, the sort of difference that this little church in Philippi did. So what will we do? Will we unite, unite around Christ? Will we live in such a way that we are consistently sharing the known hope that we have in Christ? Because if we do, then like the Philippians, joy will be a product of our lives. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for this church. Thank you for Whispering Pines and thank you for this little tiny church in Philippi that started with a whole bunch of people that didn't have a place. They had no home in, in a society that looked to human power and human strength. But they found a home in you. You opened the door and you welcomed them in. And joy resulted. Again and again and again and again, joy resulted. Lord, I, I, I grew up thinking that the best Christians in my church were the most stoic. The ones that seemed to always have a, a hardened look on their face. They were the ones that had it. I've come to find that those with joy, Lord, those with joy are walking near to you. So Lord, what might we, uh, again, this is not something we can bubble up. This is not something we can uh, create on our own. But Lord, would we come to know you? Would we come to know you so nearly and so dearly? Would your love be awakened in us to the point that joy is the obvious result, that joy is the product, is the symptom of a known hope, Lord? Because that'll be attractive. That's what I want to be a part of. That's where I want to be. Lord, might we be those people? Might our homes look like that? Might they smell like that? Might they taste like that? That we could be joyful. That we could be like Christ. That we could be like Paul. That we could be like who you created us to be. Amen.